going to be there's going to be an angel tree out there and there's going to be some tags attached to it and so i invite all of you if you uh, can help please do that grab a tag put your name on it uh, you have a few weeks to bring back the gifts that's going to be december 14th that you have to bring bring back the gifts so uh, uh, please uh, participate in that if you can if not uh, those are going to be wrapped gifts if you cannot uh, do that uh, there's options to bring unwrapped gifts, and those are going to go toward our uh, outreach uh, that's going to be December 14th as well into the community, and you can bring those and put those in the boxes as well uh, to donate uh, for, the, um, for the people when we hand those out. Uh, the last thing uh, you got in your bulletin for the, all of you that are hardcore avid runners, uh, we're going to have a run on Thanksgiving morning at 7 o'clock in Burleson. So I invite all of you to attend. It's free. And we're just going to go out and have fun. And that way, if you run, you feel less guilty about eating a lot of food afterwards. So um, if it is raining uh, Thanksgiving morning, uh, we're not going to plan on doing it. But if it's uh, uh, nice weather, we're going to plan on being out there at, at 7 o'clock. So I invite all of you to join. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and start with our service. our heads. Lord, as we enter into worship today, we pray for your presence. Lord, we pray that we will be closer to you than we were when we came, and that this service will bring honor and glory to you, and that we also, Lord, will um, learn and uh, feel a closeness to you of how to live our lives and to glorify you. So we invite your presence this morning, in Jesus' name. Um, our opening hymn, number 88, I Sing the Mighty Power of God.
Please be seated. Now is the time for our offering this morning, and I invite the deacons to come down at this, this time. And uh, this morning, the loose offering this morning goes for, uh, to support Texas Vision and the projects that it entails. So I invite you to give liberally at this time, and if you would, bow your heads with me as we have prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, it is an honor to serve you in your house, Lord. I just ask that as we give this morning, Lord, that you would direct these offerings, Lord, to the projects that they need to go to, Lord, and that ultimately would go to further your soon coming. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is the time for our children's story, and this morning's children's story is going to be given by Leroy Gillen, and I invite the children to come forward at this time, and uh, we have a chest up here to, to put the funds you collect, so as they walk by, I invite you to hand out your hands and uh, give liberally toward the children's story.
Oh boy, what a beautiful bunch of boys and girls we have today. Oh, the most important people in our church. Well, you know, I, I'm getting too old because I forget what I've told you before. I don't remember what story we talked about last time. Do you remember? What was it? Oh, about the little girl that fell in the well? Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember, so I don't have to tell that story again. Okay, I have another story today. I need a helper, though. I need somebody nice and strong. Let's see. That, that man, boy right there looks like he's nice and strong. What is your name? Chase. Chain? Chase. Chase. Mm -hmm. Chase? I want you to take one of these straws right here. Just pick out any one of them. Okay, I'll put it down here. And I want you to push that straw through that potato. See if you can do that for me. Now, while he's doing that, I'm going to tell you about two verses in the Bible that we need to learn and learn very, very well. The first verse is one that Jesus was telling his disciples, and you'll find it in John, the 15th chapter, verse, verse uh, 5. He said that I am the branch of fine, and you are the branches. And those who remain with me will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Now, here's an example. Here is the vine. And here is the branch. Now, with that vine and the branches connected to the vine, there's some fruit on it, right? Okay. Now, let me show you. Here also is a branch. Why does it not have any fruit on it? Why? It's not connected to the vine. Of course not. So that's what Jesus said. With me, you have to be connected to the vine. Now, so much for that part of our story. Well, how are you doing? Didn't make it? Well, I tell you. Maybe you get some of these fellows on the rostrum to help you. Get one of our elders to help you and see if they'll push it through for you. Now, while he's doing that, there's another text in the Bible that's very, very important. And it's found in Philippians. Now, Paul understood very clearly what Jesus said when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Because when Paul was trying to teach the gospel to all of the people, he had a lot of hard work. People tried to kill him. He got bit by a snake. He was put on a shipwreck. Everything happened to Paul. But Paul understood that as long as he was connected with that vine, he was successful. And he said, oh, good. Well, that's good. We got that. Oh, look at that. That far in. That is good. Okay, you can sit down, but before you do, I've got some more straws here. Pick me another straw there. Okay, good. I'll take that straw. Thank you. Now, Paul said, remember, he knew, understood that he had to be connected to that vine. And he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He knew that. And you know, that is so true, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. How many are in school right now? Oh, look at all about who's in school. 
Do you ever have to go through a school and take a test at the end of the week on the lessons you learn? Right. Do you always make a perfect grade? Sometimes. Oh, good. Now, remembering that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus wants you to be connected to him. And when you go to that classroom to take a less test, all you need to do is say, Jesus, please help me to remember the things that I have studied and make a good grade on my test. And he'll help you. Those of you may be taking music lessons the same way. You practice so hard, you learn your music good, but then comes the recital. You know the lesson. You get up on that stage to play that piano, you get nervous, and you make a mistake. Jesus wants to be your friend. So before you get on that, all you got to do is say, Jesus, help me to play this music without making a mistake or let it be one that nobody notices. Anything you do, from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed, always remember, Jesus wants to be your friend. He's with you all the time. <clears throat> now, that is a good memory verse for us to remember. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. Can you say that with me? All things are possible with Christ who strengthens me. Let's say it again louder. All things are possible with Christ who strengthens me. Everybody, come on, loud. All things are possible with Christ who strengthens me. Again, loud. All things are possible. With Christ who strengthens me, all things are possible. With Christ who strengthens me, all things are possible. With Christ who strengthens me. We may have to do it two or three times, but you can do it. Now, we thought that you could not push a straw through a potato. But with Jesus to help us, he said, anything with my help. Now, why was I able to get that straw through there? Because he wanted you to understand then that what we thought was impossible. We thought that it was impossible. But with his help, with his knowledge to help you and to teach you, there is a way to do everything that he wants you to do. who strengthens me. Now, let's have our prayer. Stand up and grab your hands. Circle around and yell your hands. Oh, Jesus, we thank you so much for our boys and girls. We thank you for putting regulations on them. Everything that they want to do in life that you want them to do, it's possible that they just remember to stay next to you and connected to that vine. Please, Lord, help us all to understand and to love you more than the life itself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Now is the time for our uh, opening prayer. And uh, God is merciful. And like we heard today, we can do anything through Christ who gives us strength. And so today, I want to reach out to that and grasp hold of that power. And I know you do too. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, prayer requests that are out there. And if you do have one at this time or concerns, I just invite you to raise your hand at this time and bow with me at this time as we praise the Lord. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we humbly come before you <clears throat> on our knees this morning, Lord. Country Life Church, Lord, has been blessed. And Lord, I thank you for each member that is out here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a place to worship, Lord, and for the, the truth that you give us, Lord. And you have called us to impart that truth to others, Lord. And I just ask that we as a church body would be able to impart that truth, Lord, to those that need to hear it. Lord, because your coming is soon, and we have a job to do. So, Lord, I just ask that we would get rid of our fear, get rid of our anxieties, Lord, and to know that we are doing a job to help you, Lord, to reach others. And I ask that you would give us the, the wisdom as we touch and come in contact with those that we work with, that we meet in the community, Lord, and that we would be that that light to uplift them from whatever that they may be going through. And as at this time, I know, Lord, that there's members in our church, Lord, that are going through difficult times, whether it's financial or um, healing or whatever it is, Lord. You know what they are, and you saw the hands that are raised today. Lord, I just ask that you would hear these prayers, Lord, as we pour them out before you, Lord, that they would go before your throne with a sweet incense, Lord, and that you would... Hear them, and did you answer these prayers, Lord? Continue to bless this church, I pray. And I thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Jacob. Now is the time for our scripture reading, and I invite you to open your, hymn, your Bibles with me to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth and those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we open up your word now to this point in the worship service, that whatever is on our mind this morning, wherever we're coming from, whatever things have gone on this past week, you help us to put it aside, Lord, to hear you speak to us out of your word, to be encouraged. And we just pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So the title, as you notice, I, I, like to, I always like to point out the title. It helps to remember what it was. Done good. And did you know that the Bible actually says, as David read there just now, that if you don't do good, you won't go to heaven? Well, that sounds very works-based, doesn't it? But it is what the Bible says, so we've got to find out what that means. Now, with that, I would like to just start off in the Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 has a very important verse dealing with this. It's in, it's in context of what was read for the Scripture. Uh, Revelation 20 and verse 6. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. If I don't read anything else, I would, just, I would know if I just opened my Bible for the first time in my life and I read that part of the verse, I would, I would realize it's very, very important that I'm in the first resurrection because it says those are blessed and holy. If you're in the first resurrection, it's a blessing. It's, you're blessed. Because then it says on such the second death has no power. Would you say it's relatively important to be in the first resurrection? Because if you're in that resurrection, the second death isn't going to hurt you. It doesn't take much of a theology study and word study to figure that one out, does it? But they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign a thousand years. So it's very apparent that we should be in the first resurrection. Now I want to couple that with the text that was read just now in, in John 5, 28 and 29. It was the scripture reading. And Jesus again, he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming which all that are in the graves... Where are they at? In the graves will hear his voice. So from in the ground, they're going to hear his voice. And thou, then they shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, first resurrection. They that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Sometimes it's just so plain and simple in the Bible, isn't it? Very simple. God says that if you've done good, you'll be in the resurrection of life. If you've done bad, evil, you'll be in the resurrection of damnation, which is the one you don't want to be in. It's the one that you receive the second death, according to the book of Revelation. So Jesus himself says you have to have done good in order to be in that resurrection. So today we're going to spend some time trying to understand from the scriptures how to be encouraged now. How is it you and I can be sure that we have done good? Because if you don't done good, you won't be in the first resurrection. Right? So I want to find out what that means, what, it, what, what that entails. Uh, to have done good. You know, there's an interesting text in the Old Testament. There's, it says it more than one time, but I'm just going to pick out one of them. In Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So everyone was doing good the way they sought to do good. And how well did that work out if you've read much of the Old Testament? Have you, anybody here, you read much of the Old Testament, did it work out good for them when they did what was right in their own eyes? So in, in other words, though, what was going on was everyone said, you know, this seems like the right thing to do, so let's just do that. And it usually didn't turn out so good. As a matter of fact, I spent some time really thinking this through before I was going to say it. <laughs> but did you know, that if, at least from, from experience, and, and it's this, I'm going to make this a general statement instead of an absolute, because you've got to be careful making absolute statements, but even people that are doing evil in their mind tend to think they're doing good. They think that what they're doing is justified and reasonable and right. It's what needs to be done sometimes. And even people that are doing evil 
thinks that they're doing good. How much more so that the people that are doing good think that they're doing good. And the people that think that they're doing good just based on how they feel. And they could actually be doing evil. It's all convoluted, isn't it? But, you know, the Bible says, and I, and I quote these awful, awful lot, these two texts, or I, or I think about them an awful lot when I'm studying, and, and that's the 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and Romans 15, 4. Both of them say essentially the same thing. Uh, Romans 15, 4 says, you know, speaking of, of the people, it says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our, for our uh, learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So whenever the things that we read in the Bible, read the stories, we read those so we can bring comfort and peace and have understanding of what's right and wrong. And then, of course, the other one that goes along with that is the 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, after Paul had done a great uh, job illustrating uh, like five different stories of the children of Israel that what they did, which really messed up everything, and said, don't be doing what they did because it really messes everything up. Learn from that, in other words. He says these words, all these things happen to them for examples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. So you go look at the examples and the stories and the illustrations in the Bible, Paul says, and learn from those stories so that you don't make the same mistakes. That's one of the important reasons for Bible study. And as a matter of fact, as we'll see here in, in a few stories, and, and honestly, there's multiple stories you could go through, but there's one that really stands out in my mind that I want to use as an example leading in to applying it to us. It's found in 1 Samuel. We're going to go to 1 Samuel but it's a story that helps illustrate how you, one can think and by all appearances be doing everything right and good. But the only problem with what you're doing is it's not what God says. And this is going to be the determining factor at the very end of time as to who has done good and who has done evil. It cannot, must not be based on how we think and how we feel, but what does God say? And, and just to kind of get everybody thinking along these same lines, I want you to just think about for a moment in culture, our culture today, in our world today, how far we've deviated from the Word of God to the place where things that are actually called evil in the Bible are called good by many people, even in the church, and the one that would speak against that is considered the one that's evil. Now, keep that in mind as you get the idea that Jesus said only those that have done good are going to heaven, and this, this or going to be in the first resurrection, going to heaven, and this doing of good is, has to be based not on culture or feeling or what we seem to be right, but what does God say? And I know it's like it, it, saying that sounds okay in a group like this, but in practice, sometimes it's a little different. And I want to give an example of that right now. Um, Paul, Paul says we need to learn from these stories. And so 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. And I'll give you some background. Basically, what's happened here, um, if you keep in mind, the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant. Remember uh, Hophni and Phinehas, I think was their names, right? The, 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 the sons of Eli had thought, well, you know, we can, we can conquer the Philistines if we just take the Ark of God. But God didn't say take the Ark of God, so they took the Ark of God out to the battlefield. They lost the battle. The Philistines takes the Ark of God, and then they, they took it. Now, I love this story. It's really, a, I would love to have an a actual video of the, of the events transpiring here, because if you remember, they took the Ark of God, and they put it inside the temple of Dagon, the fish god. That the Philistines worship. They put the, they put the Ark of God in there inside the same temple. And they come the next morning to come to worship, and Dagon was laying on his face beside the Ark of the Covenant. And they're like, oh, oh no, our God has fallen down. And so they picked their God up and they put him back on there next to the Ark of the Covenant. And then the next day they come out, and not only is the Dagon laying face down, but his hands are broken off, his head's broken off. And they said, oh no, now our God is dead. He's lost his hands and head. And, and then they start having all kinds of problems. If you remember, they start having like, um, diseases taking place upon them and, and there's infiltration of mice everywhere and, and just things are going bad and getting worse all the time and, and these Philistines, these heathen individuals start thinking, you know, maybe it's because in their way of saying things and I, and I love that, again, I would love to just be someone that could get some counsel to them knowing what I know now and be able to go back and talk to them and give them some counsel because they thought, well, maybe it's because we've captured the, the Israelites' God like they thought that box was their, actually their God and they, they captured it. Maybe that's what's causing this trouble. And they was trying to figure out what to do um, with this scenario. So they come up with a solution. So 1 Samuel 6, verse 5, it says, Wherefore, now this, this, is the, this is the counsel for the Philistines that they're giving one another. Wherefore, you shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Peradventure, he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from your land. 
Wherefore do you harden your hearts like the Egyptians, and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and departed? So they were reasoning among each other and said, if this, is the, if this is the Israel's God doing this, we can't fight against him. Don't you remember how the Egyptians tried to fight against him and what happened to them? So we've got to, we've got to do something here. Now, therefore, make a, listen to this, a brand new cart. Make a new cart. And take two milk kind, two cows, on which has had no yoke. So if a, if a cow's never been yoked before, it doesn't really know how to drive a cart. You know, it doesn't, it's not trained to do that. So they're, they're going to they're gonna try to make... A miracle take place to prove that it's actually God doing this. So they put the new cart. If it is God, it's on a new cart. And they set the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart. Think about that. They would have had to pick the Ark of God up and put it on a new cart. But yet, no one was struck dead according to the scriptures. It doesn't say anything about that. So they put the Ark of God on a new cart. They take two milk kind. Uh, by the way, two milk kind is an indication that they're, they're cows with babies. And they took the babies back and put them in the barn and they tied the, the cart to the cows, and he said, look, if the cows go to the barn, this isn't of God. But if the cows walk away pulling the cart away, the only thing that could do that would be their God, because the cows would natu not naturally leave their babies behind. That's pretty brilliant for, for some heathen Philistines, isn't it? So they tried it, and they said, let's see what happens. Well, so they did so in verse 10. And they said, and they took the two milk kind and tied them to the cart, and, and they shut up the calves at home. They laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice and the, and the, and the gold images that they made. And the kind took straightway to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. So the cows were like, oh, moo, moo, I wish I could go back to my babies. But somehow an angel or something's leading them along, and they're like lowing for their babies, but went away. And the Philistines followed them along until finally, verse 14, the cart came into the field of Joshua and stood there where the, uh, uh, Beth, Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kind for burnt offerings to the Lord. And they celebrated that the ark had come back to God. And they were just so happy that they'd gotten the ark back. And it was there. Some time went by. God's people decided that the ark needed to be brought to the city of David, David's king now. By the way, that was 1 Samuel chapter 6. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we're going to find out how God's people deal with this very same scenario. 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6, starting in verse 1. David decided he's going to bring this ark back, and he's going to put it in this temple, and they're going to have God back, and his, his kingdom's going to be great, and they're going to worship, and it's just a wonderful time. And it's going to be very pleasing to God. And it says in verse, chapter 6, verse 1, again, David gathered unto together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 of them. What a worship service already, right? 30,000 chosen men of God. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Bele, from Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwells between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. I wonder where they got that idea from. Now, keep in mind that the, the heathens, the, the Philistines said, let's, if, that we're going to honor this God. If it's, really, truly this, if it's really, truly a God, we don't want to be dishonorable. So let's make a brand new cart to put the ark on. And the children of Israel said, hey, let's take a brand new cart and put the ark on there. Doesn't that sound, I mean, they didn't get an old beat up cart. It's a brand new one, one that, one that may, probably likely from the text had never used before. And they put the ark of God on it, and they're going to celebrate and go along and, and cart this brand new, well, with this brand new cart, take this ark of God to the temple. Does that not sound like a good thing to do? If you were in the congregation, would anybody here think they would have any problem with setting the, God, the ark of God on a brand new cart and hauling it back to the temple, we would all be like, yeah, the king said to do it. Sounds like a great thing. Let's do it. There's only one problem with putting this cart, this ark on the new cart. God's word had said, don't do it that way. Now, keep in mind, by the way, which is very interesting. If you remember last week's message about how God deals with us differently based on our understanding and knowing, what did the children, the Philistines rather, what did they know about, God, about the Israelites' God and the ark of the covenant and how he would want it transported? What did they know about it? Nothing. So those silly people picked that ark up, set it on a new cart, drove it away with a, with a milk kind, and God did nothing to them. As a matter of fact, he blessed them for doing it because he removed their diseases. 
He actually, they, they were just doing what they thought God would have them to do without knowing better. But here, God's people put it on a new cart and brought it out from the house of Abinadab and was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, at accompanying the ark of God was Ahio, went before the ark. Now, everyone knows the rest of the story, but I'm going to read it anyway. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even of harps and psalteries and timbrels and cornets and cymbals. What were they doing? Having a wonderful worship service, praising God. Everybody would have no doubt, I, I would think that everyone feels really good about this service. Like for the first time in ages, the ark is now coming back and it's, and it's on its way to the, where, where the king is going to be living and, and Israel's being established and it looks like just everything is going in their favor and the worship service is wonderful and they're doing everything good except what they were doing is not what God had asked. A lot to learn from that. And when they came to Nations, Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. Now again, poor Uzzah. Um, I mean, I read some commentary on it. Of course, there was things in his life he wasn't repentant of, different things like that. But the fact that he, would thought he was doing what any one of us would have thought to do. You don't want the ark of God falling onto the ground, right? And the, and the cattle shaking the ark and it's falling. Oh, I got to stop it. And as he reaches out to stop it, he struck dead. That put, a, that put a, a damper on their wonderful worship service. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. And then it says in verse 8, and which I think is an interesting text, David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perazah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark come unto me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside to the house of Obed, Obedetum, and the Gittite. Now, why in the world was God so harsh toward them? That seems pretty harsh, doesn't it, you? Now, it is interesting. I, I found here in a couple of places, I'm going to read you some text, and this will give you an idea. Did you know that eventually David realized why it happened? And actually, kind of, he repented and made sure he'd done it right the next time. Listen to this. Now, Numbers 4, verse 15, it says, And when Aaron and his sons, Numbers 4, 15, when Aaron and his sons had made an end of the covering of the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp was set forward, after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burdens of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. So, particularly um, of the family, the sons of Kohath were to be the ones to carry the ark of God, but they were not to look upon it or touch it lest they die. That's what the word of God had said. So was God doing anything wrong by striking down someone who touched his ark? What was going on wrong here? As, as you realize, you know, and we got to make this application eventually to ourselves as we're moving through here. But first of all, God had told them that the ark was to be carried by the priests on the shoulders with rods stuck through the ark that were never to be removed. They were to, take this, to carry it that way. If they'd have been carrying it that way, would the cows have stumbled and caused the ark to fall? No, because it wouldn't have been there to start with. The cart wouldn't have been the only cart to start with if they would have done what God had said. But they looked at, I have no, I have no doubt in my mind. The, car, the ark was brought to there by a, uh, by, by a couple of milk kind with, um, on a new cart. And they thought, well, must be okay. Let's do it the same way. So they got another new cart, and they're hauling it along. In other words, God's people and their decisions were influenced by the heathen. After all, the heathen is doing it, and it seems to be good. So therefore, if we do it, it must be okay too. Is that a fair enough assessment of that? I think it's very fair. Look at what they're doing. If they're blessed by it, we can do the same thing. The argument happens oftentimes in religious circles even today, sometimes even in our homes, sometimes, you know, like in our church, in homes, in community, we look at what others are doing and say, well, there's no harm in it. They seem to be blessed by doing it. So therefore, let's do the same thing. And God's word says, have you not learned anything from what I've taught you in the past? And I like this because if you go with me to 1 Chronicles, there's, a, there's another part of this story. In 1 Chronicles, 
uh, as it's recording the same story or what happened after the same story. And I love how it's worded here. Very powerful. First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles 15 and verse 1. By the way, in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, it tells the same story. Um, you get down to verse 10, it says Uzzah was killed by God, and it's telling the story, first story, the same story. But when you get to chapter 15, it tells the rest of the story, if you will. Second, 1 Chronicles 15, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, it says, David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God, and he pitched for it a tent. Then David said, no one should carry the ark of God but the Levites. (laughs) See, just two chapters later, earlier, they tried to do it the same way the heathens did, and it didn't work out so well. So now he's saying, no one should carry it but the Levites. For them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. And David gathered all of Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron, the Levites. Now, hold on a minute. If you remember just before this, right as God had killed um, or struck dead there, Uzzah, as he struck him dead, it said that David was afraid of God and didn't know, and he thought, how am I ever going to get the ark back? Apparently, sometime between that point and this point, he read the Bible, actually, read the Word of God, had somebody maybe pointed out to him the Word of God and said, you know what, David, King David, we didn't do it right. We need to follow it the way God said. And now all of a sudden, David becomes a little bit more bold, uh, bold, bold in the Lord, if you will, and he says, okay, if we do it the way God does it, everything that wants it done, everything will work out. And so he says, let's do it God's way. And then he gathers all these priests together. Now, I want you to go on with me, if you will, down to verse 13. So he's, he basically, in verse uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, he talks about the people that are going to be involved in bringing the ark back the way God would have it done. Verse 13, he says, oh, let's start in verse 12. And he said unto them, You are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord of God of Israel unto the place that I prepared for it. For because you did it not at first, for the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for we sought him not after the due order. He said we were seeking God, but not the way God wanted to be sought. We weren't doing the way God wanted to be done. We tried, but we weren't doing it right. And he says, because we did, it not, we did it wrong at the first, this time we're going to do it right. And he had the priests, the Levites, sanctify themselves and bring the ark of the Lord up before Israel. And this time, everything worked out just fine. Isn't that interesting? Do you think God kind of works the same way today? Do you think if, if, if today that you and I... Even if we've done things wrong to start with, if we will repent for that and look at what God's word has to say and turn and do things right, that God would honor us, that God would bless us. It's interesting here that no one was struck dead the second time when they brought the, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the temple. No one was struck dead. As a matter of fact, they celebrated, they, they danced, he danced before the Lord, it says, they played the instruments, they sang, they worshiped, and everything was great, and nothing was wrong. Everything worked out just fine this time. You want to know why I think everything worked out just fine? Because they did good. Not what they thought were good, but what God's word said was good. Now, there's another story, and I'm going to give you the shortened version of it because we talked about it once before, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, the story of King Saul. And in, in, in the bottom line, without reading all the details of it, because we did read this story not too long ago, but we'll, we'll touch on it some. But what I think is interesting about this story of King Saul is that King Saul thought that he was doing good. King Saul thought that what he was doing was right. As a matter of fact, he was actually doing better than what God had asked him to do. Now, if you're doing better than what God asks you to do, isn't that good? Or does God just simply want us to do what he asks us to do? Right? But in his view, he was doing better. And that's what I think is so important about this story as we read it. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and in verse 1, the Bible reads this way. Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen thou to the voice of the words of the Lord. Think about that text, just, just what that's saying. God has sent you, now listen or hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. In other words, all you have to do, king, is what God says. You can't go wrong there. Just simply do what God says. Now, what's really interesting about the rest of that story, if he would have just simply did what God had said to do, tell me, how do you think things would have worked out? 
They would have been just fine. But from this point forward, they went downhill very fast because he did not what the Lord asked him to do, but what he thought was right in his own eyes. And so you, you can read about it when you pick it up on down there in verse 10 when it says, uh, Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, It repents me that I have set Saul to be king, for he has turned his back from following me and not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried all night. Samuel was really sad over it. But if it down to verse 13, you read that Saul says, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. In Saul's mind, had he done good? Yes, he done absolutely right. But what was the problem? He had not done what God had asked him to do. Saul had thought he had done good. David thought he was doing good. As a matter of fact, you can read through the Bible and you read lots of places where people are thinking they're doing good. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take another step that makes it a little more dangerous for me. But today, there are many people worshiping, even on this very day, who in their minds are doing good, but aren't following the word of God. Is that a fair enough assessment? It could happen to you. It could happen to me that in our minds we're doing good, we're doing right, but we're not following the Word of God. As a matter of fact, this is the one saying since I've become a Christian that I've, been, I've noticed that's been throughout, almost without exception, when you try to reason with somebody that aren't, that's not following the Word of God, it usually goes along these lines. Well, as long as I have a good heart and I'm a good person, as defined by them. We feel very comfortable in realizing that, you know what, I'm not a bad person. As a matter of fact, if I compare myself among ourselves, as Paul said, it's not wise, as I do that, I find myself a really good person when I compare myself to, well, none of you, but other people. Keeps me safe. You think about what's going on in these stories we read. The individuals in the story in their mind had a good heart, was doing good. Do you not think that David or Uzzah or any of these boys... Fellows in the story you read in Samuel there thought that they were doing wrong? Do you think in any of their mind, any of them thought they had a bad heart? Or that they were, now I'm not talking about like heart attack heart, I'm talking about in the way they, they trusted in God there, right? Do you think any of them thought themselves as anything other than a good person? But yet something was wrong. As a matter of fact, you can go so far... Is which, we, which we are doing in this world today, in our culture today, you can go so far as to where you come to the place where we become to the, begin to think of our judgment as what is good and, good and right. And what we, what we look at to say that it's okay and good and right, if we actually compare it with what the Word of God says, it's sometimes even the opposite. I'll give you examples to illustrate. But first, and from the book of Isaiah, verse five, chapter 5 and verse 20, we can come to the place where we think that what we're doing is good. It's actually evil. That's happened in the Bible many times. But it's even worse when you come to the place where you see people doing evil and call it good. Self-deceived, if you will. And the Bible addresses that, even in the New Testament. Listen to this, Isaiah 5, 20. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. So was, do you think that's in the Bible because that was something that was happening? Or do you think that's in the Bible because, because God just wanted to warn you? What do you think? I think it's a little bit, I think it'd definitely be both. But definitely, there was a, the, he says, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. That means it's happening. In other words, there are people that look at evil and call it good and look at good and call it evil. Now, the really interesting thing about that is the person that calls evil good and good evil, let me say it the right way, the people that call evil good thinks that they're right. Is that making sense? The people that call evil good think that they're right, which is very scary <laughs> to think that they would then call good evil, and they think that they're right. They put darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, giving an analogy there. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. That basically, by, by, by the way, my friends, in very beautiful words, tells you how you can make sure that you're not calling good evil and evil good. You have to be sure that you're not basing it and judging it on your own eyes and in your own sight. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. So in other words, if, if what we're judging is right and good based on our own eyes, our own sight, we're going to make errors. It could very well be possible that as individuals, as collectively as groups, do you realize that you and I could actually 
come to the place, even now, where you think that people are good and you actually think, that, think of them as being evil? Do you think that would be a dangerous place to go into? Or, or even worse, or just as bad, do you think it'd be possible that you and I could be thinking that we're doing really good, we're doing what is right, doing what is just, and all along God's saying these people are wicked and I'm going to destroy them? Was that not a little bit scary to you? How can I be sure that I don't find myself in that situation? Because here, once again, I want to emphasize those that are doing those things don't know it. The Bible calls them deceived. Today, many have come to call good evil and evil good. The place to where they are doing evil while convinced they're doing what's right. I can give some really good examples in, in just in our culture today. And, 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 I, and I'll tell you, it, it's prevalent. Like one of the things that, the, like I'm going to put it in a, just a brief summary, I guess. People look out today and they see sexual immorality and they use a term called love is love. To say it's okay, to justify it. And, and that, even to the place where if someone else were to stand up and say, I don't think that's right, that person is then called evil. Do you think that's a dangerous place to be as a church? I mean, you expect it, I guess, in society in a way. I expect the Philistines to be that way, don't you? I mean, the Philistines put the cart on the, on the, I mean, the, the ark on the new cart. They, they kind of really don't know better, but, but the people that do know better, they did it too. It can happen in our day. So I want to spend a little time now trying to figure out from God's perspective how we decide the criteria for having to have done good because the Bible says, if you remember, you have to do good to go to heaven, right? Those that have done good to the resurrection of life. So how can we be sure? And there are some um, words that I, I don't want to miss out on as we go through this, and, and one of them is very strong, and everyone knows the text quite well, but we must use it and apply it here. It's found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Jeremiah, chapter 17, and we're going to read verse 9, but it does apply to us, even though everyone knows it quite well. And it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. And what's the word there? Desperately wicked. So when someone says, well, you know, I have a good heart. I'm, I'm, I really think myself as a good person. The Bible says that you are actually deceived because your heart isn't really good. Have you ever noticed, by the way, how you, the, your tendency is to do what's wrong and you have to have like a, 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 the Lord to come in and help you to understand to do what's right because naturally we want to do what's wrong? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how easy it is to be evil? Has anybody noticed that besides me? No, you're all just naturally good, right? You know, I love illustrating it this way. You know, from, from the time we're just babies, we are naturally evil. And you're just like, babies aren't evil. I can prove it. I can take two babies, not yet at the age of one. I can set them on the floor right here and put a toy between them. And I can watch one baby pick up the toy. And the other one see the baby with the toy and pull it away from the other baby. And the other baby will take the toy away from the other baby and hit him over the head with it. Don't tell me that we're good. Where did they learn that? Have you ever seen kids do that? Have they been taught to be selfish? How many parents here teach your kids to be selfish? How many parents here teach your kids to be bad? Oh, no, that's good. Don't do that. You, you don't let that kid take your toy from you. You take it back. How many parents do that? Then why do they do those things? It's, it's amazing to me. It really is a, a, like to study humans. <laughs> We're such a funny species to study. We are naturally evil. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, I know those sweet little babies aren't really that... You know the nice thing about the baby is, though, right? The other baby takes the toy and he hits the baby in the head with it. And one minute later, they're best friends. The older you get, the longer it takes to repair that damage. You know, the first time you even accidentally hit somebody in the head with it, they don't forgive you for years. All right? That's why I think one of the things Jesus said, you have to become like a little child if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> They're just as mean as you are, but they, can, they forgive and go on, right? And I, I just love that. They can, they can like set it aside and forgive and, and just move forward. And, you know, he goes all the way up through the, the, through the teenage years, and I don't know where the change takes place, but at some point, you know, even teenage, teenage kids. Now, I hope no one gets upset with me. I'm, I'm kind of a realist, but particularly girls, you know, they'll fight in the teenage years a whole lot, but they're, but they're still best friends. Like, I, I've, see, I've heard them, I've seen them, you know, like, they're on the phone talking about their best friend to another friend, and they're like, oh, they're such a dog, and then all three of them are friends again in no time, and they just, they've got, and then at some point, that even changes to where once that breach is made, we're not friends for years. 
I know guys do that too, but I can remember being a guy when I was younger growing up and, and I was moved away from home and I was in an apartment with like five other guys and every once in a while there would just be a good fight go on and it wouldn't be 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, they'd be, everything would be fine again and you know, they, were, they, they were over it. You know? And I had other parent friends that were girls and they would have the fight and they would move out and never speak to each other again. Now, I know there's exceptions to that, but if that bothers anybody, I don't really mean to bother you, but that's just the, that's just the kind of natural way that things work. You know, you don't have to like it. <laughs> but Jesus, the Word of God is saying here, the Word of God says our heart is des- desperate, desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord searches the heart. He tries the reins figuratively. That means the inner self. The Lord looks at your inner self. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doings. Isn't that a powerful? Jesus says, he that does good to the resurrection of life, he that does evil to the resurrection of damnation. Here we read in the Old Testament that God looks at the heart. He tries the reins, the inner self. He, he looks at the very depths of who you are, and he, and he weighs that out, and he says he gives to every man according to the fruit of his doings. In other words, he's working on our hearts, and how you react to that, he's going to, be, he's going to judge you based on that. He's going to give you a reward. By the way, to give a reward... Again, this is, this is very interesting. To give a reward to someone or a punishment, he would first have to first make a decision as to who gets what. Found in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? A, a, a symbol or a sign, if you will, of, of an investigative judgment that God does. It says it very plainly there. He justifies the... Uh, I'm sorry, he, um, speaking of God. He says he gives to every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. In other words, God would have to first look at it and then reward accordingly. So whether or not we think we're doing good or not has to be based on what God's Word says and not the way we feel. 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, if you want to go there with me, 1 Timothy, the second chapter, I want you to find out what's acceptable to God. Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Savior, rather. Speaking of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So when we're basing on what is right, what is wrong, what the criteria is being used here is very interesting. God says he doesn't want anybody saved, but what's the criteria for them not being saved? They come to a knowledge of truth. And, and by the way, if you come to a knowledge and an understanding, you will, of truth, and you're following that truth, you're doing good. We're going to move into that a little bit now and understand that's what's said throughout. I, I, I like studying and reading quotes of people that are getting ready to die. It's kind of morbid, isn't it? Um, but you read through history, and I, and I find some things that are this very interesting in many places. And, and one of the guys that was getting ready to die one time, Jerome of Prague, and by the way, you find a very similar saying by, by many uh, people, but his last words uttered as the flames arose about him was this prayer, Lord, Almighty Father, have pity on me and pardon my sins, for thou knowest that I have always loved thy truth. And I just appreciate that. Like, in other words, as he's dying, he, he, the, the, way, the way he wants to make sure he's right with God is the fact that, God, I always loved your truth. And keep in mind, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, so it's a, it's a way of showing affection to God and, and the love for Jesus is the fact that I've loved your truth. Even when I've messed up, I still love what is right and good. That's what he's saying. Forgive my sins where I've messed up but you know I've always loved your truth. As we're moving along to make sure that we're on the side of right and we've done good, we find very plainly in the scriptures that it has, amounts to our heart to do God's will and not our own. You know unrighteousness, sin, is very deceptive. Doing bad while thinking we're doing good is, is it would be a deception, and, and sin is very deceptive, right? Right? Um, there's another text in Thessalonians, uh, okay? It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'll start in verse 9 in reading this, and it's a very good text. As a matter of fact, I know I have a, started a little ministry some years ago called Love for Truth. I just do a little thing with that every once in a while, try to keep it like online, things like that. Love for Truth, it comes from this. And it says this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not a love for the truth that they might be saved. So Jesus says, those that have done good come forth the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Here it says, 
that those people that perish, the ones that are the ones that perish, have not a love for the truth that they might be saved. Isn't that an interesting statement? Unrighteousness, in other words, is deceptive. Because it says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, which means that, that unrighteousness is very deceptive. Did you know it was? Did you know that unrighteousness is very deceptive? It really is. The multitude of people that are doing evil thinks they're doing right. So that would mean they're deceived. The Bible warns of that. And how was it they were deceived, by the way, when you're reading this, into doing what was not good? They were deceived because they did not have a love for the truth that they might be saved. And it says, now for this reason, God will then send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Isn't that a powerful statement? The fact that God's word says that people that love error, that's what he'll give them. To the place then, if you, if you love error rather than truth, you'll think that error is right and truth is wrong. God says that's what's going to happen. Which is very encouraging to me as I look around in the, in the Christian world today and the secular world today and just the, sometimes the, the Adventist church world today. And I look around and I see that some things that are being done, that are being believed, that are being said are 100% in contradictory to the word of God, what it says. But yet everybody thinks they're doing right. And God's word says that that's what will happen. He'll actually, God himself will send them a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie because that's what they want to believe. They will think they're doing good while they're doing evil and being lost. The reason I'm giving this message today is particularly because I don't want that to be any of us. I don't want to be any of anybody. Like God doesn't want to be the any of anybody. The Bible says that he doesn't want anybody to be lost, but everybody to be saved. But God is using reality. He's a realist, if he will. And he says, okay, I want to warn you. So if you want to do what's right, if you want to follow me, if you want to be saved, you can be. Here's the criteria. Please listen to what I'm saying and follow it. But if you insist on having your own way, he says... For this reason, he'll send them a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie, that they all may be damned who believe not the truth. But listen to this. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. The wording is very powerful. Because if you think about it, those that are practicing evil while calling it good are taking pleasure in unrighteousness. And the real problem is that I think that I personally believe, as it's been throughout the entire Bible, those who would dare even speak and say that it's wrong become the enemy. Those who would dare not live according to the lifestyle of those that are doing that become the enemy. So how can we be sure that we're not deceived? How can we be sure that we are not the ones that think you're doing right while all wrong you're doing wrong? It goes back to the Word of God, right? Right? Jesus uses a good example here. If you want to go with me to Matthew chapter 25, we're getting close to the end of the message here, and I've got a good parable here that Jesus gives us an example of an understanding of, of people that thought they were doing good. But, well, individual, but wasn't. Matthew 25, verse 14, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country. So Matthew chapter 25, 14, the kingdom of heaven. And again, uh, uh, to repeat myself a little bit on this, how many times you read, the, particularly the New Testament, and Jesus uses the words, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like. In other words, he's trying to help us to understand it because we can't get our mind around what the kingdom of God is really like. Right? It's like trying to talk a go tell a goldfish what it's like to breathe air. Right? He, does, he just can't get his mind around it. No matter how many times you tell him, he's not going to understand it. And so God's trying to help us to understand heaven. He says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country. Who has called his servants and delivered them his goods? Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his ability. And straightway he left, took his journey. And then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made the other five talents. Likewise also that he had two. But he that received one went, he dug a hole in the ground, and he buried his Lord's money. It seemed like the right thing to do. After all, he's going to give a good reason for doing what he did. It seemed like the right thing to do. Isn't that interesting? He didn't bury his money because he thought he was being wrong. He buried the money because he thought he was doing what was right. Don't miss that. After a long time, I always appreciate that Jesus says that. After a long time, the Lord of his servant comes. All right? Jesus is coming soon, but it's been a long time since he's come. After a long time, those servants, the Lord of those servants cometh, and he reckoneth with them. I love the King James there. He reckoneth. 
And so he that received five talents came and brought five more talents. And the Lord said, he said to the Lord, I've delivered, you delivered me five talents. Behold, I've gained five besides them. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Good servant. Did he do good? Yeah. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, I've delivered unto you two more talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents besides them. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said to the Lord, I know that you're a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gather where you are not strawed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast what is thine. Here. His Lord answered and said unto him, The wording is strong. Thou wicked and slothful servant. But didn't the servant think he was doing good? Honestly, if you would just pause for a moment and kind of think, if you'd never read this story before, and you read down to that line, why would, you, why would the Lord call him evil? If you hadn't read past that line yet, why would he call him evil? Did the Lord give him a talent? Yeah. Did he return it to him? Yeah. Did he steal from the Lord? No. In your mind, did he do okay? In my mind, he's done great. He did nothing wrong, right, from a secular, worldly standpoint. I'm talking about if I've never read the story before, I didn't know the rest of the Bible, I didn't have the context, I'm just reading the story, and someone tells me a story about a master who gave a servant one coin or one quarter, one talent or whatever he gave him, right? And then, and then some years later, he comes back, and the servant gives it back to him, and he says, you're an evil servant, and I'm going to have you take everything away from you, and I'm going to throw you away, you're going to be destroyed. You would think that that master would be unfair because, after all, did the guy steal from him? No. He gave him back what was his. And it seems like it would be the right and good thing to do. But the Lord said it's not good and right. Again, I think it's the, the, the fascinating thing about this to me in looking at this in the context of what we talked about today is the thought that you and I can think something is good and the Lord call it evil. <clears throat> Must be basing it on the Word of God, huh? I mean, any decision we're making in our family life, our personal life, anything that we're thinking about has to come back to say, God... What do you say? Can you imagine how different the world and the church would be today if we asked the question that way? Lord, what do you say? Think of the story of Peter. The guys came to him and said, Does your master pay taxes? Oh, of course he does. Yeah, he pays the temple tax. He'll pay it, right? And then he goes and talks to the Lord. And remember how Jesus responded? I don't pay those taxes. In a sense, he says, who pays the taxes? The, the uh, servants or, or the, the foreigners or the children? And he said, well, the foreigners do. He said, then children are free. Remember that story? If Peter would have come to Jesus to start with and find out what God had to say about it, things would have been differently, I think. But Jesus says, I don't do that. The word of God would teach that, P- that Jesus would not pay that. But Peter thought, well, I'm doing what's right. I don't want these people to be upset at my Lord. So I'm going to make a decision here to do what's right. Good. Seems small. But I love how that story turns out, by the way. He says, by the way, to show them that I don't have to pay that tax, go down and catch a fish and pull a coin out of its mouth and give it to them for my tax money. And for those that are asking, that's why I fish. (laughs) Take, therefore, from him and give it to him that has ten talents. For unto every one that has shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But him that hath not shall be taken away that which he has. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That seems pretty serious to me. And honestly, if you and I have been looking at this, if this is a story like this, if it's not a parable, it's a real story, we would look at the, at the guy that was in control as unjust. We would actually side, tend to side on the guy that had the one talent that he was okay and good and treated unfairly. But he had not been faithful to God. That's what the story is about, right? That's what the parable is about. He wasn't faithful to God. He didn't do what God would have him to do. Is that fair enough? 
Now, I'm going to finish it up with, a, with something that Jesus says to help illustrate how important it is that it is that, that we do what he would have us to do, how important it is we do what he says and not what we think it says. And everyone's going to know, know this text quite well, and it's going to help apply to everything we've looked at down to where we're at right now. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Everyone here should mostly know what's being said with this verse. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus had just told the people, hey, um, his disciples, he said, you know what? There's a broad way that leads to destruction, and the majority are going to be on that path. Let me ask you a question. The majority, the majority that are on the path to destruction, do you think they know they're on the path to destruction? No. I can guarantee you if you thought you were on the path to destruction, you would get off of it. But they thought they were okay. And then there's a narrow. And they thought they were okay. And, they, and the ones that are on the narrow path, the ones straight gate rather than the narrow gate, they were the ones that are okay. And it's the few that were going to be on that. So by the way, just as a, as a little side note leading into this, if you're with the majority, you're probably wrong. I can't think of a time in the history of the Bible where the majority were right. And the prophecies of the Bible at the end of time says the majority's wrong. Is that fair? So, I mean, you can't base it on that. You have to base it on the Word of God. But you better be doubly cautious if you're with the majority. So Jesus says this. In Matthew 7, verse 21... Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I remember reading that in times past because I, I like to read the Bible sometimes and I'll read a little section. Like, you know how people, how people say, oh, I read five chapters today. I read like five verses sometimes, <laughs> right? Because I want to chew on and understand like what's being said, the, the context here. Nothing wrong with reading large passages and large, large, many chapters. That's great. We should do that. But when, sometimes when you start really chewing on it and thinking about it and making an application, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere that all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Well, maybe there's a deception going on here where they think they're calling on the name of the Lord, but it's the wrong Lord. Maybe there's something not... Maybe it's a group of people who thinks that they're doing good and right, but all along they're doing wrong and evil, thinking they're saved, but they're actually lost. If Jesus predicts that's going to be the case, let me ask you this question. There's a penetrating question to your heart this morning. If Jesus says this will be the case, do you think it'll be the case? Yeah. How can you and I be sure I'm not those people? I want to be right with him. And he makes it very simple. I, I, I kind of sometimes when I preach and I say things, I make it sound confusing. But Jesus makes it quite a bit more simple, and he'll lay it out right here. So listen to this. Many, would that be the majority or the minority? Usually in the Bible it's the majority, okay? So not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, listen to the wording, doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Let me say it another way. He that doeth good. The will of the Father in heaven, is that good or bad? Good. So he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, so he that does good. Right? But now look at this. Many, majority, will say to, me, say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Now, honestly, if you see people literally prophesying in the name of God, it can mean the word preaching as well, you know, preaching about God. Casting out devils, you see people demon-possessed and they're okay and in a sound mind. And doing many wonderful works, feeding the poor and clothing them and giving food to the hungry and, and helping and just helping and doing. The, if you saw people really doing these things in the name of the Lord, would you not in your mind think they're on a fast track to heaven? I mean, I read this pretty personal and pretty, it's pretty serious to me. I mean, should we not do these things? Yes. But he said there's going to be many that's going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we've done all these things in your name. Then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Were these people deceived? Yeah. Jesus predicts it will happen. They were deceived. They were running headlong quickly through this earth, through their life doing great things in the name of God, but we're not obeying the word of God. That's what this says. They were practicing iniquity. And by the way, we've, you, you can nail this down by studying your Bible. Many other times we've, we've, uh, we've talked about it in the past, but when it says they that are working iniquity, the lawlessness in some translations, the bottom line is they weren't practicing the word of God. My friends, there are a lot of atheists 
that do a lot of good works. But there's not any atheists that love and obey God. We can't have one without the other. Doing good according to the word of God is obeying what God's word says. We can find ourselves just like the children of Israel, putting the, cart, putting the ark on a new cart and driving it away, all along disobeying God. So what do we do with this? I guess in our lives, whether it's personal, family life, church life, the way, the way we interact with others, you and I have to learn not to go by what we think feels right, what we think looks right. But what does God's word say is right? You know, ultimately, he does say, Blessed are they that do his commandments. They may have the right to the tree of life. They may enter in through the gates of the city. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are those that do good. That follow what God's word says. When it says commandments, I think it, it talks about the ten, but it's encompassing the word of God. Blessed are those that, that find out what God has to say and make their decisions accordingly. My friends, if we, you and I, let our decisions be based on what culture and the world is doing, we're going to be among the people that Jesus says, get away from me. And so my prayer is that we take from this as a individually or as a people, that we ask, what does God say before we make decisions? Amen. And we live by that. We're going to have a closing hymn now, number 306. Draw me nearer. closing prayer to be the second verse of that song and it says this consecrate me now to thy service lord by the power of grace divine may my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in yours Amen. let's pray lord we pray that our will will be found in your will 
that the things that we do and that we call right and that we see as right and wrong doesn't come from our culture and our hearts, for these are desperately wicked. But Lord, may they come from your word, and may our lives abide in that, so that one day we'll be in your kingdom, abiding forever. We'll be among those good people that you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And it's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.